So good morning. Uh, this is my second of my two lectures on uh, <coughs> black holes. So let me just quickly recapitulate what I did yesterday, and then I go on to the new material. Uh, there's a quite a lot of it, so I will not hurry through it or try to cover whatever is there. Uh, we'll take it as it comes. So we we consider the geometry around a black hole, and then we so if, if the how does the particle move around a black hole? And then I introduce the concept of effective potential. And so in, the, in Newtonian theory, the effective potential would look like this, with a minimum here. Whereas in Einstein's theory, the effective potential will have minimum, okay, and a maximum here. And then depending upon what is the energy of the particle, its orbit could be either hyperbolic or parabolic or elliptic. In Einstein's theory, the ellipse is, it is nearly elliptical, but the ellipse is not closed. Then we talked about how you get a uh, orbit as angular momentum decreases, you get an orbit uh, which is called the last stable or circular orbit, the innermost circular, uh, innermost stable circular orbit, I ISCO. That, uh, that concept is important because uh, <coughs> that, that concept is important because it tells us how much energy can be extracted from the orbit. Sorry, I'm trying to find it. So here uh, we found that depending on whether the black hole is rotating or not, and then here when it is not rotating, the angular momentum of the black hole is zero, spin angular momentum. Okay, then you will find that uh, you can extract the, the innermost orbit is at about six arc. Whereas if it is a co-rotating orbit around the extreme black hole, then rg can be one, and the smaller the rg, the greater is the amount of energy that you can extract from it. So from an extreme curved black hole, you should be able to extract about 42% of the rest mass of a particle as it falls into it. Now, uh, now the formation of stellar mass black holes. Now we have already considered <coughs> the interior of a star and we said it, when I worked on white valves that we have got first the hydrogen which is converted to helium. And then before helium ignition sets in, the inner parts have to contract the outer parts have to expand, and then you need to have, uh, and then helium gets converted to heavier elements. That can, depending on the mass of the star, that can, for a sufficiently massive star, it can go up to iron. But okay, then after you can't proceed beyond iron because the nuclear reactions involved are no longer exothermic to endothermic. Right, so then, uh, so a massive star uh, explodes, and then uh, you get the inner part collapses, and then you get a compact object. So we found three kinds of compact objects, white dwarfs, uh, and then different kinds of white dwarfs depending on the mass of the star. But the mass of the star is between 12 and 40 solar masses. Then the initial mass of the star, then you can get a neutron star, and then, uh, then if it is the mass is greater than 40 solar masses, then you get a black hole. But these are all objects. A, a white dwarf is uh, typically like half solar mass, etc., but never more than the Chandrasekhar limit. All non neutron stars are close to the Chandrasekhar limit, with just a few, um, few neutron stars significantly above it. And then black holes, of course, can have any mass, but depending on the mass of the star. But those objects also are in multiples of the solar mass, so 20, 30, 40. So, and, uh, and then uh, we talked about detecting these black holes. So there, uh, you see, uh, we found that we need to have a binary star because a lone black hole would be quite invisible to us except through its gravitational attraction. But then we considered a situation where you have got uh, a binary, right at the beginning of my lecture. So I said that a black hole or a neutron star uh, could have a, could be the binary system of stars. So when you have got a binary system, and the, the potential around the two stars is extraordinarily interesting. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through it in detail. But basically what happens is that, just consider two stars, you very well consider them to be point objects in the beginning. And then in that case, what happens is that when you go close to one star, you'll get circular surfaces, uh, spherical surfaces, 
close to the other star, again you get a spherical surface. But when you move away from the star, then you have to take into account not only uh, the attraction of both stars, the attraction of both stars, but you also have to take into account that the binary system is never stationary. The binary, the binary is always in motion around each other, which introduces centrifugal force. When you take all that into account, it turns out that you get these lobes around it, which are known as Roche lobes. And those Roche lobes touch at one point. But that's a remarkable point, which is known as the first Lagrangian point. There are actually five Lagrangian points, but this is known as the first Lagrangian point. And what is its importance is that if you've got a particle sitting here, then it's unstable equilibrium. So if you push it in this direction, it will spiral into one star. If you push it in the other direction, it spirals into that star. So here, the particle is under, it is in an unstable equilibrium under the attractive forces of the two stars. Mm -hmm. And then also because the stars are going around each other, the centrifugal force. So what happens is that when you've got, a, when you've got an object like, a, let's say there's a black hole here, then as the companion star, it evolves, it expands, and it fills its slow slope. Then the matter in the star, which is touching the first Lagrangian point, then you see that uh, the gravitational forces are balanced with the centrifugal force. So therefore, the pressure force due to the star at this point, there is unbalanced. And that pushes the material into the gravitational field of the other star. And because the material which comes in has angular momentum, it goes around it, forms a disk, and then gradually, this is known as the accretion disk. Uh, this was the accretion disk, and through it, the matter gradually seeps into the black hole, and uh, it emits energy. I'll come back to this briefly in the later. Okay, so then, uh, when you've got this kind of a situation, then you get X-ray binaries, now, X-ray binaries are two kinds, high mass X-ray binaries and low mass X-ray binaries. In high mass, the mass of the companion star uh, is greater than the mass of the compact object. In low mass X-ray binaries, it is less than the compact object. Now, this has got uh, a lot of influence on the way the system evolves. Right? So, uh, so, many such binaries are known. About 100 binaries are known in our galaxy. The binary is also known in other neighboring galaxies. Uh, and then what happens is that, uh, so you can measure, it's very tricky measuring the mass of the compact object. It turns out if the mass of the compact object is more than about 2.5 solar masses, then it would mean that, because that is the limit of the mass of the neutron stars, so you can't have uh, neutron stars and then it must be a black hole. So in this manner, I believe that about 20 black holes have been identified. But this identification is slightly uh, indirect, somewhat indirect, um, in the sense that you can't really point out and say that, look, here is a mass, here is a black hole, and what you call intercontinent, uh, absolute evidence for it. But the absolute evidence for stellar mass black holes uh, comes from gravitational wave detection. So all of you, I'm sure, know that in 2016, in February of 2016, the detection of the first gravitational wave source by the LIGO detectors was announced. It was a very momentous event, and then it was celebrated all over the world. I mean, people are gathered. For example, in the Chandrasekhar Auditorium of Ayuka, the auditorium was full of people in the middle of the night who had come to listen to the announcement which was going to be made uh, in uh, Washington. Okay, so what happens there is that you have got two objects which are compact and these compact objects are going around each other very rapidly because not only are the objects compact but the binary itself is compact and then it emits gravitational waves as it emits gravitational waves the system loses energy I'm absolutely sure that somebody or the other in Alka lectured you on this so I'm giving you a quick summary and as they emit gravitational waves they lose energy and therefore they move closer together and therefore, the gravitational waves are continuously emitted even more quickly. And the system finally, they just merge together, and then you get a single object. And then you see here, uh, 
the gravitational wave being emitted, which is the frequency, the frequency of the uh, gravitational wave is equal to the frequency of rotation, twice the frequency of rotation. And then you see here uh, that the, as the rotation is becoming rapid, the frequency of the gravitational wave is increasing. And then as a merger takes place, it goes, uh, it, it just sort of goes haywire, and then it gradually settles down. And uh, this is known as a ring down phase. So you've got <clears throat> two massive objects which are merging together, and they form a single black hole at their end. And here, uh, these two merging objects could be, it could be a pair of black holes, it could be a pair of neutron stars, it could be a black hole and a neutron star. And the whole process takes, the detection occurs, and after people waited for 20 years to make the detection, the first detection occurred, you see how rapid it is. On the x-axis here, you can see the time, and this is in seconds. And it just, it sort of started detection here, and then it ended here. So it was, I think, just 0 0.7 seconds or so. And you have to detect it in that very, very short time. Now, uh, one can measure the mass because, because one can make very precise calculations here, numerical calculations, and then there are all sorts of ways of doing these things. You come to a precise estimate of the uh, mass of the objects involved. So in this case, the, the bigger object at 36 solar masses, the smaller object at 29 solar masses, and then they combine together to form a single object of 62 solar masses. And then it had a measured spin, which is shown here. And then the distance, which is 410 megaparsec. megaparsec. And then uh, now the question is, what happens to this? You see that the objects which are going in, the total mass is 65, but the object which is created in mass of only 62. And uh, the difference must have been emitted as gravitational waves. And you can also calculate independently of these mass estimates, uh, what is the amount of gravitational waves emitted, and then you'll also see that it exactly matches this mass loss. So it's a totally amazing, uh, a totally amazing observations, okay? <coughs> Now, the, a very important thing is that the black hole binary in its merger could not have been detected by any means other than the detection of gravitational waves. So how, first of all, uh, let's say, how do we know that these are, uh, these compact objects are black holes? Okay, you see, I, I showed you that the, that the signal frequency is rising, which means that it is a binary which is moving close together. Binary is fire. Because as the two objects in the binary move closer together, they rotate more and more rapidly around each other, and therefore the frequency of the gravitational wave increases. And then uh, the detailed evolution of the frequency and amplitude, the details of the signal show a very massive object. Okay, now the highest frequency reached, highest frequency reached depends upon how close these objects get to it. And that frequency which is reached, one can show that the objects got within 200 kilometers of each other. So clearly, these objects could be normal stars, for example, massive stars. Because uh, uh, you know what the, what the radius of the sun is, 700,000 kilometers. Right? So therefore, uh, two such stars couldn't come within 200 kilometers of each other. Okay, But because of their large mass, we know that they can't be neutron stars. But they can't be white dwarfs, they can't be neutron stars. So there is absolutely no alternative left to these big black holes, right? So every everything here indicates that we have got detection of black holes. But then, uh, then you start your other interesting things here, because uh, first of all, the black hole binary. If these are black holes, then they emit absolutely no electromagnetic signals. So which means that you couldn't have detected them by uh, yeah, uh, you couldn't have detected them by any way at all, any other way at all than the LIGO detection. Okay, then uh, now uh, after the detection was just at the start or just before the start of the first observing run with the LIGO detectors, then you have got the two LIGO detectors and then you have got the Virgo detector and then Kagra also makes some contribution, or some contribution. And over a period of time, okay, over a period of time, uh, so two, three observing runs, uh, a large number, a large number of detections have been made. And there is this beautiful diagram 
a very pretty diagram which shows you the detection which are made. And you see, for example, if I look at this pair of objects, what these three objects, it tells you that there are two black holes which combine together to form this object. Now, this particular layout here, you go to the top and you go down, that is just for visual, visual convenience. It, it has no physical significance. Okay, so you see that this is the highest black hole which has been emitted, the most massive black hole which has been created. And you see that it is close to 200 solar masses. Right, and then, uh, then these are all, these are all uh, the red ones. Uh, these are electromagnetic black holes. What do you mean by that? Means that these black holes were detected because of the electromagnetic signals which are emitted, not during the spiral, but as X-ray binaries, about which we have talked. Okay, and then uh, these are electromagnetic neutron stars. Okay, meaning that these as neutron stars also have been detected because of the presence in objects like X-ray binaries. Right, so now we have to be able to explain where all these very massive black holes came from. And this particular black hole here, which approaches 200 solar masses, it is in the range. If you remember, I said that the range of the intermediate mass black holes uh, is from 100 solar masses to about 100 solar masses to about 10 to the 5 solar masses. And you see that this is the first object known which is clearly in that particular range of uh, black holes. Okay, so now, now the question is, how do you form these very massive black holes? And you see here, for example, that, uh, that uh, here I got the mass of the star. You remember that in the past we did mass of the star and the mass of the remnant in the table. So this is the mass of the star. And what is the mass of the black hole that you can generate? Okay, so you see that that, that depends on the metallicity and so forth. But you'll find that generally you are able to go only up to about 80 solar masses. But these, these models have now been improved. And uh, uh, so particularly the very massive ones which I showed you, it says binary complement masses of 85 and 66 solar masses. Then uh, the primary mass, the positive the pair instability model. So what happens is that uh, you had these old calculations which told you what is the mass of the black holes which can be detected. But later on, uh, because of the detection of the large mass black holes, then one has to go and revisit all the uh, all the physical uh, assumptions which have been made. Okay, and then there are different kinds of uh, things are there. Mass gap black holes could be formed through various channels, including multiple stellar colloids, colloids or hierarchical mergers in star clusters or in active galaxy nuclei. What do you mean by this? Is that uh, there are these already formed massive black holes from stars, and then these can merge with each other and form bigger black holes, and then you can get another black hole binary and so on. Okay, then there are uh, various other possibilities too. But I should tell you that this is an extremely active area of research, and uh, there are no firm conclusions. That this is something that those of you who take to a PhD in gravitational waves, may uh, end up working on these things. Now, uh, I've finished with stellar mass black holes, and in the time remaining to me, uh, we will do supermassive black holes. Right, so supermassive black holes, what the range of supermassive black holes? It is about 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses. Right, so uh, now if you want to look at the range of these things, so in just one moment, let me rearrange the screen so you can see what I have. So this is a <clears throat> this is actually a dwarf galaxy, uh, Parkerian 462, at a distance of 33 megaparsec, and it turns out that it has got a black hole in it of 2 into 10 to the 5 solar masses, right? So, uh, so you see that this is uh, the, the range of supermassive black holes is about 10 to the 5 into 10 to the, 10 to the, uh, how much? 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses. So here you have got something which is right at the bottom of the range, okay, 10 to the 5 solar masses. Then, uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, 
Now you have got here uh, a giant elliptical galaxy. Okay, this is Hopper 15A. Now this uh, elliptical galaxy is here. You can see it right in the center of the image, and you find there that the mass of the galaxy itself is about seven into ten to the thirteen solar masses. It's a very massive galaxy. About uh, uh, our galaxy is <coughs> much more massive than our galaxy, and the uh, and the estimated mass of the supermassive black hole uh, is uh, four into ten to the ten solar masses. So one black hole I have shown you, not shown you, meaning I give you an object where you've got a black hole which is rather low for supermassive black holes, and this one is at the higher end of supermassive black holes. So now, uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't think I have time for this one. Eddington scales. Let me skip. Okay, so now um, you know, I'm sure that you have been, people have talked to you about galaxies. And then you see here, uh, you, can, you can have something called the Hubble diagram in which you can arrange galaxies. And so you've got here, you've got the elliptical galaxies on the, this is called a tuning fork diagram. And then this is the base of the tuning fork. These are the two arms of the tuning fork. At the base of the tuning fork, you are essentially elliptical galaxies. Right at the start, they are almost spherical galaxies, and then they become more and more elliptical. And then on the Upper arm, you've got what are known as spiral galaxies. And the lower arm, you've got spiral galaxies too, except that all of these spiral galaxies have got a structure which is known as a bar. And at the junction of the two arms, you've got lenticular galaxies, which like the, which have got a massive bulge like the elliptical galaxies. But we also have a disk like the spiral galaxies, but they do not have uh, any spiral arms in them. So lenticular galaxies are a transition class between elliptical and spiral galaxies. Now, some of these galaxies, particularly the elliptical galaxies, uh, have been identified with very strong X-ray source. So look at this very beautiful X-ray source, where, um, again, this is something which I'm sure that you have been exposed to. This particular X-ray source is known as Centaurus A, and there it has got two massive, two, two very large radio lobes. You must clearly understand that this is not an optical image of the galaxy. This is an image of the galaxy. So where you've got these two radio lobes, and the lobes of radio emission, and you can see here this jet which is found. So initially when, we, when people uh, were observing radio sources with very low resolution instruments, but they started discovering radio sources in the 40s and the uh, and then there are a number of radio sources, each one of them appeared to be a single source. But then in 1972, two graduate students working in India, uh, one was Jenison and the other was Das Gupta from Calcutta. And then they, for the first time ever, uh, <coughs> looked at a source called Signals A, which I'll show you in a moment. And uh, you've got Signals A here. They looked at this source and they saw, instead of seeing just one lobe, they found two lobes which are present. Okay, so this is the first ever detection of a binary structure, a double lobe structure in the radio source. Then uh, in the ensuing years, after that, after 1952, now we are in 2022, 70 years, and then gradually better and better telescopes were used. And this is a beautiful map taken with a VLA, where you see all the details of this double structure and a jet joining it. Because when there are the two radio lobes, the question was, how are the two radio lobes powered? Because they are very luminous, they are emitting a great deal of radio power. So one possibility was these are these are clouds of charged particles and magnetic fields which have been thrown out from the center and which have been propagating out, and then and then they continue emitting. But then uh, there are sort of very beautiful physical arguments which said that that is not a possibility. And what actually happens? is that there's energy emanating from the center in the form of a jet. You can see the jet here. And this jet consists of radiation as well as it consists of charged particles. So we go and energize and we go here, the large magnetic fields, and then they, the charged particles emit radiation, synchrotron radiation, and they light up as these two things. Now, this is just a radio structure. And then if you look at it, it will superimpose it on the structure of the galaxy. Okay, uh, 
Okay, so so there you can see here that uh, uh, these are the two radio lobes, and this is the is a massive elliptical galaxy at a distance of three to five meter parsec, and then this one here is a uh, is a bridge of dust. That the radio structures can be very much larger uh, than the optical structures. So here, coming back to sickness A, in which the double structure was discovered by Dargupta and Jameson. And then you see these incredibly beautiful jets which are coming out here. Very fine, very resolved jets. Right? So, uh, so then where are the jets emitting from? They're emitting from the center, and which is actually the center of the optical galaxy. So clearly, there is something at the center, okay, which is emitting uh, this energy. Right, so now here is another object with a rather old, rather old image uh, of taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's very beautiful. It was taken uh, in 1996, as you see. And you see that this object here is a star. How do we know that it is a star? Okay. <clears throat> So it will start because you can see the structure here and then you can look at its spectrum and then you'll know that it's a star. And then here you've got to the center of the frame. You've got another object which looks exactly like the star, but if you look at its spectrum, it is totally different. A star, a star will have, a, a, a star will have basically an absorption spectrum and you know that it has got a black spectrum because the hot object and superposed on the roughly black spectrum, so you've got absorption lines. But this kind of an object has got emission lines, as we'll show you in a moment. It is possible for you to measure the redshift of this object as they both estimate the distance. And then you'll find that the amount of energy which is emitted by this uh, is like 10 to the 44, 10 to the 45 Earths per second. A star, on the other hand, emits like 10 to the 33 Earths per second. So this object, which looks exactly like a star, is 10 to the 12 times more powerful. And it is very far away, and it has uh, and these objects are called quasars. So you see that the quasar spectrum it consists of a lot of emission lines. So one of the uh, things is that the quasars vary very rapidly. First of all, they have got emission lines, which means that they are energetic phenomena which are present, and then the quasars vary very rapidly. And rapid variation is associated with a, with a very small distance. Because if a, a small radius for the object, because if it were, if it is an object like a galaxy, where light takes 100,000 years to go from one end of the galaxy to the other end, but then uh, it couldn't have rapid variability. Rapid variability essentially means that the object which is varying has got very, very small size. And how rapid is the variation? It could happen, uh, they get variation over a few years, uh, in fact, variation over a few months, and if you go to the X-ray domain, you can get variation over seconds. So, which means that rather than having a large 100,000 light year diameter like our galaxy, these objects have got light seconds in diameter. So, these are extraordinarily compact objects. So, what it means is that in the centers of galaxies, you have these extremely compact objects which are emitting a great deal of energy, and some of that energy some of that energy gets channelized to, uh, uh, to into jets. Okay, so jets which could be which are very steady for extraordinarily large scales. Then there is another uh, marvelous phenomenon uh, which is known as superluminal motion. So if you particularly if you look at uh, the galaxy M87, I'll be mentioning it again if I get the time. So then if you if you just look at uh, a small tiny a bit of the jet. Okay, this is, this is a jet, radio jet in M87. And these are the optical observations of the radio jet with, uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so then you'll find that this structure is, this is in 1994, 1995, 1998. Okay, so if you, uh, so you know the distance to M87, so you can estimate the speed with which these structures are changing. And then you find that the change corresponds to superluminal speeds, meaning that it could be up to six times the speed of light. So now Einstein has told us in 1905 that nothing can move faster than light. And here we have <coughs> here we have these uh, structures which are separating from each other, seemingly 
at six times the speed of light. Okay, so how does that happen? So there were any number of uh, theories and models. And this was in the 1960s that it was discovered, 1960s and 1970s. And because you required real BI, very long baseline radio interferometry, which gives you very high resolution. And then, uh, again, as usual, a graduate student uh, called Martin Rees in Cambridge, and he gave the most, uh, the simplest solution to this problem. Look at Martin Rees, of course, many of you might have heard about it. We got Martin Rees now, and he's one of the most distinguished astrophysicists of the uh, current time. Okay, so his explanation was extremely simple. So you've got those two lobes separating, I showed you. Imagine that there's one lobe sitting here, and another lobe is thrown out, uh, making this is the line of sight, and another lobe is thrown out, making a small angle to the line of sight. And it is thrown out at a very high velocity, uh, approaching the velocity of light, but with uh, but smaller than it. So no violation of special relativity. Then he just simply, in a small calculation, which you could do in five minutes, he calculated that the apparent speed uh, with which this will be seen to increase, the two separated given by this expression here, V by A, V apparent velocity by C, is equal to beta sine psi, one minus beta sine cos psi. Where beta is V by C, where V by C is the real speed of thought. Then you can see that uh, as beta, uh, <coughs> as beta goes towards one, and then you see that beta A can become large, very large. You can see that here. Okay, so uh, so what is the what is the requirement for this? Is that this angle is quite small, and this angle, in fact, is given by one upon gamma. So gamma is the Lorentz factor. So you see what Martin Rees established in this calculation is that uh, the speed of light is not being exceeded, but nevertheless there are massive parts of the sources which are moving with speed close to the speed of light. So they have extreme energy, and where does this energy come? from? Okay, so, so these are all problems that we have to consider. And then you see here, again, the galaxy M87, where it has got lobes, it has got the jet, and then you see that the jet is being viewed at higher and higher resolution, and you see this beautiful jet here. So, uh, so then where does it, then Linden Bell made a calculation. Professor Donald Linden Bell, other very great astrophysicist. So, so you see that, he showed that the energy in the lobes is 10 raised to 60 to 10 to the 64 ergs. If this, if this energy is being released gravitationally, then, uh, then the gravitational energy must be equal to the lobe energy, and which requires a mass of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 10 solar masses. And most amazingly, you will find that this is exactly the range of supermassive black holes that we are finding. So all the observations that I have now brought to your notice, they are all uh, they all point to the existence of a very massive object at the center, and from which the energy has to be drawn in some mysterious way. Right. So, so this established the idea that there there are supermassive black holes. So, our current idea is that if you take active galaxies, active galaxies, what are active galaxies? Our galaxy, you know, has got a I've got uh, about 10 to the 11 stars in it. And the average star is the sun, which has got a luminosity of 2 into 10 to the 33 Earths. So the luminosity of our galaxy, due to the luminosity of its individual stars, is about 10 to the 44 Earths per second. So if you if a galaxy like this also emits at other wavelengths, meaning like infrared or um, uh, or, or let's say that at uh, X-ray wavelengths or radio wavelengths, and if that emission is comparable to the emission from the stars, because stars don't emit, stars emit X-rays, but it's very, very low luminosity. So, um, so if the galaxies are luminosities which cannot be emitted by the stars, then it is known as an active galaxy, because it means that it has got something active in it, producing the energy, which is not attributable to stellar processes. Right? So then uh, you've got active galaxy and actual, as you have heard, there's a large accretion disk and a torus around it and so on and so forth. It gives it the appearance that we know. 
So today I would be concerned uh, with uh, <coughs> with the black holes. So all the arguments that I gave you so far, uh, which I have only done in superficial, but uh, at, uh, because of the time constraints, and then you have to look for that can be established that there is a uh, black hole at the center of the galaxy. It is one thing to argue that there is a that there is a black hole, uh, but other to say that look. Can I see a compact object at the center of the galaxies? Okay, and then uh, then say <coughs> and then actually measure its mass. And that was most elegantly done uh, all through 10, in fact, 20 years of observations by two completely independent groups. Uh, one based in Europe and the other based in uh, the USA. Okay, they established that there is a supermassive object. I won't call it black hole, a supermassive object at the center of a galaxy. Right? So, so these two people here, and uh, so Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Gels, and, uh, they got, uh, they were awarded half the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of a galaxy. But you may remember that at the start of my talk, I showed you a picture of Roger Petros. Okay, I can say that he got the half the prize. And the other half the prize, other half of the prize in the same year was shared by Denzel and Gates. Right, so, um, so you see that here is a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. I want to tell you a little bit about their marvelous measurements. So here's a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, so this is, this is the part which is in the, in the constellation Sagittarius. And then you can see here, you can see this uh, clear day, particularly if you go southwards in India. And then this part is the center of the galaxy. So this is a beautiful near infrared image of the galaxy. You don't see the whole of the galaxy, it's only a part of it because other parts become fainter. Okay, and then this is done by you point your NIR camera to different parts of the plane of the galaxy, our own galaxy, and then you put the, make a collage. Okay, so the uh, of the galaxy, and then you've got the center, and then you've got the disk. And if you look at it from the top, which we are not doing, then you see the spiral arcs. And what is important for us here is a red color that you see, which is because of the dust which is present in the disk of the galaxy. So now, uh, uh, so now these objects, uh, what they said was that, you see, that's the position of the sun is about somewhere here, and which is about eight kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy. Okay, so now the idea of the following, which which, uh, which the two uh, leaders of the group, Scott, uh, Genzel and Gess, so they said that if there's a massive object at the center of the galaxy, it should uh, affect the motion of the stars in the center of the galaxy. So if I can measure the motion of the stars, uh, then I should be able to say what is the mass of the object. That's a very simple idea. And then, uh, but the great problem is that, uh, first of all, it is 24,000 light years away the center from us, which means as you take the stars there, they will become faint. The other problem, of course, is that uh, because of the dust, there's a, the, there's a lot of absorption of the light from the stars, and they become many, many, many magnitudes fainter. Uh, because, first of all, they are far off, and then, then, so it's very difficult to observe them. And then the way to observe that is you use near infrared image. Now, near infrared cameras are much more difficult to use than optical cameras. You near infrared image, which has got two advantages. One, the absorption due to dust is uh, the minimum in near infrared uh, uh, at near infrared wavelengths. And second, you get the highest possible resolution because you know that the Rayleigh criterion. Uh, <coughs> But uh, yeah, higher, near, in fact, high resolution image. You, you do high resolution image, which is possible in the near infrared. So now here are some pictures of the galaxy. So, so you see here, uh, the cent this is a radio map of the galaxy taken at 90 centimeters, okay, 1999. And at the center of the galaxy, there's a source which is called Sagittarius A. Okay, which is a Sagittarius, uh, which is a radio source. Okay, now uh, this was later observed, uh, 
and it it uh, it has discovered uh, a source called Sagittarius A star. It's an extremely compact radio source, which was uh, discovered by Ballick and Brown in 1974, and it was named A star, meaning A because it's an exciting source. Uh, a star. Okay, uh, in 1982. Okay, and then it was found that this particular source is not moving at all. Okay, meaning that it doesn't mean it doesn't move at all. It means that the movement was much less than could be resolved at the time. Okay, therefore it implies that the source was very massive. Now uh, I won't go into this. And then you see here is that you have got uh, this very beautiful HKL composite. Meaning there are three near infrared wavelengths. K is at 22 microns. Okay, and uh, and then they use a uh, thing called speckle interferometer adoptive optics in order to get high resolution, and these are possible only at near infrared wavelengths, and that is why the near infrared wavelengths provide the highest resolution. So you see that incredibly, I told you that the size of the galaxy is 100,000 light years, but this scale here of this is so 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 such small scale that you can see here that this bar. Is six light months. Okay, so which means that this is just a few light months across. Okay, that you are observing the center of the galaxy to such fine grain. And then uh, this is a zooming in on the stars, and uh, this is Sagittarius A star. Okay, so which you are localized now, and that's something which is not familiar. Right, and then you see that here over a long period of time, and incredibly difficult observations because of the difficulty. Is maintaining a coordinate system for such periods of time, and then you see that so many stars are being observed: 1995, 1999, 2000, 2000, and the same stars. So star S1 is here, S1 is here. Okay, and then you see here uh, this amazing uh, piece of work, where this is Sagittarius A star, and this is star S2, which was followed. It is sort of merging with the cross of Sagittarius A star. And then when you when you actually measure the positions of this at high resolution, and you can see this incredible diagram that you are getting. This is the position in 1992, 1995, 2000, 2002 or a 10-year period. And what is the shape here? Even to the naked eye, it is obvious that it's an ellipse. And the most amazingly, Sagittarius A star is at one focus of the ellipse. So now, if you go back 400 years, this was exactly what was done by uh, Kepler. Okay, when Tycho Brahe gave Kepler the data on Mars, Kepler worked on this for a long time, and then he uh, did, uh, then he said that look, the orbit of Mars here is an ellipse. Okay, the Sun at the focus of the ellipse, and then he gave his famous law which said that all the planets move uh, in elliptical motion with the Sun sitting at one of the ellipses. So we are 400 years in the time of Kepler, but what we have got is exactly the same, except that it is not Mars which is going around. Uh, it is not Mars which is going around the Sun. It is a, a star very close to the galactic center, going around uh, Sagittarius A star. And then you see that uh, the perisenter distance is only 17 light hours. The closest distance to approach to the Sun is only 17 light hours. And then the period is 15.2 years. And what is the mass of the object, central object, which can be measured using Newton's laws? It's 3.7 into 10 to the 6 solar masses. Right. So you've got a. So this is a later observation in 2009. And uh, and then you see uh, the two things here. One is that uh, these are observed the two different groups, uh, Gensel and Gess. And so the one color is by one group, the other color is by another group. And then you see that these uh, observations very beautifully substantiate each other. Okay, then and then you have measured the mass here, uh, right? And then there's another interesting thing: is that the central object. We have been saying that Sagittarius A star is moving, is not moving, but here it uh, it appears to be a moved slightly, and that was completely consistent with this. Beautiful thing here. Yeah. You see that now the ellipse has been traced for one whole orbit, and then you see that here the ellipse, the the measurements are accurate enough to show that the ellipse is not closing on itself. 
right? And why the ellipse is not closing on itself? It is because the central object is moving, and that was the supposition. So see how the observations are. But then let us go further into the future. And uh, uh, so you see here, uh, very much more uh, accurate observations have been made, right? And then you see here, <coughs> uh, so then you see that Sagittarius A star is no longer moving, and yet it is not closing. So why is it not closing the orbit? The answer is incredible. <coughs> you know that as I said general theory of relativity. He uh, he made three different predictions. One is that there will be gravitational direction of light, and the other that there is a bending of light, and the third is the precession of the perihelion apogee. So, if you please recall my detailed discussion yesterday, we said that in general relativity, when a particle has negative energy, it is it moves on an ellipse, almost on an ellipse, but the ellipse doesn't close on itself because of the one upon r cube term in general relativity. The ellipse is so moving slightly in the sky. Right? And then Einstein made a prediction for the perihelion of Mercury and turned out to be exactly correctly matching the observed residual perihelion, which was a great triumph for general relativity. And that is what we are seeing here now. You see that these measurements, when you look at it and then you, uh, you interpret the measurements, and then you find that the orbit is actually precessing. At the rate of 12.1 arc minutes. Okay, so this is observation and it exactly matches the precision which you expect from general relativity given the mass of the object. Right, so what is happening is that the star S2 is just coming in from a distance, it's going here, close there. And as it does so, in, in Newtonian theory, it will again come back exactly on the same thing, but according to Einstein's theory, that the orbit will be precessing. So you can see that here. Right, so this is one orbit, and then this is a highly exaggerated, of course, as you can see the precision here. So, so which means that uh, we not only have established that there is a very massive object at the center of the galaxy, but we have also established that this massive object uh, <coughs> causes the general relativity precision in the star S2. So it's no wonder these people got uh, these people. Uh, Got the Nobel Prize. Okay, so uh, now I will come back to this uh, in a moment. But first, let us see what is the other evidence. Uh, you see that we have we have only established that there is a that there is a, a compact massive compact object. You can always argue that it is not a black hole because after all, it is not a tiny tiny object. It is uh, we don't know what the size of the object. You can see it's not a black hole, it's just a massive compact object. Okay, so can we see the signature of a black hole? Okay, so you see that for that you have to go back to X-ray astronomy. And I told you about X-ray binaries, X-ray emission from supermassive objects also. And then uh, when you look at the X-ray spectrum, the X-ray spectrum, you'll see, because of the details of the composition of the gas there, you can see a line of ions. Okay, so this is a line of ion 27. And it's a very sharp line, we've been exaggerated here. And you can see this kind of a line in the observations. Now, how do these X-rays arise? Uh, so uh, it's a rather complicated process. So you've got a supermassive black hole there, and then you've got a disk which is present. And this one here is the innermost circular orbit. So you see, uh, as matter falls into the disk, it slowly makes its way inwards through many, through a large number of spirals, which are almost circles. And finally, the matter reaches the last circular orbit and then just plunges into the black hole. So you can observe it only up to this point very well. Okay, so uh, then you see here, uh, when, you, when you look at ideal, then in Newtonian theory, if, if, if you had a single sharp iron line, then it would have split into two parts like this. Because you'll, you'll observe the line coming from here, and then you'll observe the line come, going there, and just splits. Then there are special relativistic effects which take place, uh, uh, which, which again, so first you get this, this distortion, then general relativity produces gravitational redshift. 
if you take all that into account, then if you've got a sharp iron line, okay, then it gets modified like this. So you see that this, so what is this? This is due to the redshift. The redshift depends upon how much it has fallen. So the closer the innermost circular object is to the black hole, that is the greater the spin of the black hole, then the more will be the redshifted wing that you see. Okay, so, so these were the first uh, uh, measurements reported by Fabian in 2000. And you see that if it is a Schwarzschild black hole, then this is what you get. In the curved black hole, this is what you get. Okay, and then uh, now we look at X ray emissions of this galaxy MDC 63015, the iron line. And then you see this very beautiful line here. And then, uh, so then and you see this very large extended uh, thing here, and which shows that first, uh, it cannot be a non rotating black hole, it has to be a rotating black hole. And the data, uh, and it shows you that it must be a rotating black hole with a spin parameter A by F is equal to 0 0.9. So this is the nearest that we have come. Uh, to establishing that it is indeed a black hole. Okay. Um, now I will uh, I come to the end of my time, and what I will do is that I will take you uh, to uh, the last part of it. I'm going to skip some very interesting things which I had in mind to do, but let me look at the appearance of a black hole. So we have got we have got our own galaxy, and it is uh, and in which we have established the existence of a uh, of a very compact object. Similarly, we also have argued that in the galaxy M87, there's a compact supermassive object. Now, uh, now what people have done is that they decided that, look, there's a lot of bending of light which is taking place around an object. Uh, and so, uh, because of the, uh, we, we, we showed you, I, I agreed for the potential well, etc. And so then, uh, how do I, uh, then can I actually try to image a black hole? In order to image a black hole, first of all, you require very high resolution. And so that has been done over the last several years by something which is known as the Event Horizon Telescope. And the Event Horizon Telescope consists of a series of uh, millimeter telescopes, okay, which are millimeter observations because they're uh, the wavelength is the largest, and therefore the resolution is the highest. And then you see that the telescope is as, uh, divided there. And the baseline can be as large as 10,800 kilometers. And then we go back to our friend M87. So what the group did was that they observed M87, and then they observed the object at the center of our own galaxy. And then you, uh, you really, uh, so it turns out that the because our, our galaxy, the center of our galaxy is so much closer to uh, us than M87, it is more difficult to analyze the data. You may, you may say, no, 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 it should be easier. It is more difficult because there are a lot of different physical, astrophysical effects which have to be allowed for because of the very accurate observations which are possible. So uh, the group, the Event Horizon Telescope group, decided to concentrate on M87 where also they have the image, okay, and they did that, and then, uh, okay, and so they, they use VLBI, very long baseline to get 1.3 millimeters, as I already mentioned. A decade-long program was carried out. Okay, and what they did was that, they, uh, in 2017, they released this image, which is absolutely fascinating. Okay, so so you see that you've got, uh, you've got a dark spot in the center, and then you have got this broad band here, and then you have got uh, a bright thing. Okay, so so where does this all come from? Okay, so uh, so you see uh, the the explanation actually is to get this image is very difficult, to interpret is very difficult, but explanation is overall fairly straightforward. Because I told you that light bends around the black hole, and as the light bends around the black hole. Uh, now just imagine that you had a you had a very bright screen in the sky which you're looking at, and you keep a black hole in front of that screen. Then what will happen is that any light from the screen which reaches the event horizon of the black hole will be instantaneously absorbed. Right? So it, uh, you'll never see that. 
So therefore, uh, you 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 expect to see a hole in the bright event, okay, which has got the radius of the event horizon. Okay, then uh, if you remember, uh, I told you the event horizon is at the Schwarzschild radius uh, in a in a non-rotating black hole. But I told you that there is something called the photon sphere at 1.5 times the Schwarzschild radius. Right, so then photons are trapped in this sphere, and then you expect to get a very bright ring there. But then because of various rings, the, uh, because of the various effects, the ring gets plotted. Okay, then uh, if the if the part which you see at the bottom is rotating towards you, okay, then there'll be a velocity directly towards you, which because of special relativistic effects make, make the light coming from there much brighter, the radiation coming from there much brighter. So if you take into account all these effects, then this is the, now this is the event that they're gone. But what is the theoretical situation? So these are what are called the general relativistic magneto hydrodynamic points. And so, so you see that this is the photon, photon ring. It's actually a photon sphere, but we are seeing a section across the sky. And this is what you expect. But, uh, but you observe it using a telescope. So there's a broadening thing from the telescope which I just mentioned to you, and that gives you this. So this is amazing because these are numerical simulations, the numerical models which have been generated using very, uh, very uh, well done calculations. Okay, and then you see that they exactly match uh, the image that you have seen. So this was the first black hole image you see. And subsequently, a second uh, black hole image of our galaxy also has been released a couple of months ago, uh, but I shall not go into that. Okay, all right, so I will stop here now. The time has run out, and there are some things which I couldn't do. Let me just go back to them. Yeah, so one, one thing is that how do you form these supermassive black holes? Okay, so we have seen, uh, <clears throat> we have seen that the black holes which are of stellar mass, uh, they, they, are, they occur in the final explosion of stars, but those also can't reach the things which have been observed by LIGO. And those uh, more massive stellar mass black holes are generated through various other processes. But you start with black holes which have been created by stars, and then you get them to merge into each other and so on to form an even more massive, massive black hole. Okay, then, uh, but then when you look at the supermassive black holes, quite a long time ago, in 1984, <clears throat> but I believe that he did it even before that, with Martin Rees, the same Martin Rees who talked about superluminal motion. Gave this diagram, which has become incredibly famous. Everybody shows it all the time. And then here you have traced various pathways. You cannot go into that, but please look up uh, supermassive black hole creation diagram by Reese. Just put it into the internet and you'll get this. And I strongly recommend that you read about it. Okay, but then it turns out, and this is from a review by a very highly readable short review by Voluntary in 2012. And so you see that you start with dark matter, and then you uh, there are different processes by which you can form these black holes. Okay, then uh, you don't uh, because you form large black holes. Uh, suppose you form a black hole with a few thousand solar masses in one way or the other, that can continue to accrete matter for a long period of time, and in the process become more and more supermassive. But then you are talking about billions of years. But the problem is that there are, uh, let me see if I've got the picture here. Uh, if you look at this object here, which is the most distant quasar known in 2021, okay, January 2021, and it is at a, it is at a redshift of 7.7, .7, and then uh, 7.6, it has got a luminosity of 1.3 to 10 to the 47 Earth per second. It has got a black hole mass of 1.6 into 10 to the 9 solar masses. Right, so and because this quasar is located at a very high redshift, the black hole is located at a very high redshift. Okay, and at that time the universe was very really, yeah. clear, meaning that this object that you are observing emitted light just after the big bangs. Right, so which means that uh, it has got a fully formed supermassive. Earlier, just 670 billion years after the formation of 
uh, uh, after the formation of the after after the creation of the universe. Okay, so we should mean that there will be very little time for this one to be start off as a less massive black hole at accrete mass because you cannot accrete mass at more than a certain limit. Okay, so there is a mystery. How was this black hole formed? Okay, so uh, so we uh, I'll leave you with that mystery. And uh, again, I should assure you that these are all uh, matters of current research interest, and you should really look up papers there, and you may yourself be involved in such research. So thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, do you see any questions in the chat? Uh, let me see. Yeah, in the, there are two questions here. But the first one is from Subrata Saraki, and it says, is the creation of SMBHs only through mergers which have taken place all along since the first BHs were created? So there are, um, um, I'm really not an expert on this, but there are many different ways in which you can create them. Uh, because as I told you, that let's say, uh, if, you, uh, if, you have, so if you have black hole, let's say with one, one billion solar masses like a black hole in our galaxy, and let us suppose that black hole, black hole eats about one star per year, which is not very much, which can easily happen in the circumstances. So one star per year, so in 10 to the 9 years, which is not a very long uh, time on these kind of cosmological time scales. So 10 to the 9 years, and you'll get a 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole. So simple accretion from matter around a black, the black hole at the center of the galaxy can go on increasing its path. You can get supermassive black hole. But the interesting thing is that this requires a lot of time. So you want to create a 10 to the 10 solar mass black hole at the rate of one solar mass per year, you essentially need 10 to the 10 years. Right? So therefore, but then I showed you, this is all right. I said, what the problem that can be done? Because the universe is older than, about as old as that. Then you find that uh, <laughs> At very high redshift, you get a supermassive black hole. So clearly, that has been formed through other processes. Okay, then okay. Uh, I, I don't understand how do we account for the super. I'm very sorry, uh, I couldn't do the calculation for you. But what I can do is that, let me see, I can't promise that I'll do it, but if I can find the place where I've done the calculation already, I'll pass it to. Professor Devrati, so that she can put it on the thing and you can take a look at the calculation. But it's very easy to find it on the internet. Okay, then why haven't we been able to detect white holes? Shouldn't they be easier to find? Yeah, uh, you see, the problem is that how do you find the black white hole? See, first of all, uh, there, are two, there are two things. One is uh, uh, <clears throat> why do we talk about white holes? See, that is because. Uh, when you look at the solution of a black hole, then when you look at it in a formal way that various people did, Penrose did, for example, then you find that the solution is incomplete, meaning that there is a definition of incompleteness, it's called geodesic incompleteness, and then a black hole, the mathematical representation of a black hole, it is as if you have got only one half of a diagram, and then you extend it to the other half naturally extend it to the other half, nothing to prevent you from doing it, then you naturally get a white hole. Now, just like uh, things can cut, will fall into a black hole, the you know, white hole things emerge from a white hole. Then people have done these calculations as to what kind of spectrum they should have, etc. There's also a paper by Nalikar and Chitre on it, and then they have done these calculations, but there has been no sign of that. Like, for example, if you look at a gamma ray burst, could it be a white hole? Uh, this has not really been, it has not been possible to interpret any known observation as the signature of a white hole, and that is why you have not seen it. Okay, then let's see. 
why does accretion occur in the form of discs and not spheres? Uh, and can accretion induce rotation in the black hole? Yes, very, very good questions. I mean, I like these questions very much, and I really wish that we were face to face. Now, first of all, uh, in astrophysics, there is certainly something called spherical accretion. Now, you just imagine putting a star in the middle of a cloud. So you've got a cloud of interstellar matter, and you put a star in it. It is going to start accreting. And that accretion does occur through a disk. Okay, it, it is a spherical accretion. And it was worked out many years ago. Uh, there is a very famous cosmologist called Herman Bondi, and he worked on this spherical accretion. And uh, spherical accretion doesn't have very high efficiency, but certainly does occur. Now, why, why, do, why do I keep talking about disks? That is because it's a completely different astrophysical situation. So you've got a black hole in a binary. And black hole is, is the mass from the companion star is flowing onto the black hole. Now, this mass has got angular momentum. And it is coming in through the Lagrangian point. So it is clearly not spherically symmetric accretion. And because of the angular momentum, the matter starts going around the black hole and in the process forms a disk. Now, the supermassive black hole also. Just imagine that it is eating up a star or eating up the ambient gas. That this gas also has ideal. So, and therefore, uh, it turns out that you always talk about disks. Uh, uh, would it be possible to create a black hole in a lab? Clearly, you can't create a supermassive black hole in a lab, right? Where will you get the 10 to the 10 solar masses from? So, then there are all these mini black holes, etc. And uh, I have heard some such th about some such thing, but I'm sorry, I cannot give a better answer. Any further questions? And you can ask if you don't want to write the questions. All right, if there are no further questions, then we can end the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adi. If you have any material, uh, please send it to Santosh.